Across the United States, cousin marriage is a vanishingly rare phenomenon with rates of about 0.2% or one-fifth of 1%. 1 but in the colonial and antebellum periods, it was much, much more common, particularly among elite merchant families in New England and more broadly in the South. Today we'll explore why that was using a passage from Bertram Wyatt Brown's book, Southern Honor, Ethics and Behavior in the Old South. In view of the intense Southern desire to increase the bonds of family reliance and to enhance both career and marital success by concentrating wealth, intermarriage among cousins, first cousins included, was relatively common. The pattern was not at all unknown in the 18th century North, especially among wealthy merchant dynasts. Whereas non-kin marriages diluted the holdings of a family, the marriage of first cousins reconcentrated the portions, the supply of socially preventable mates being often so very small. But as New England merchants grew wealthier and economic opportunities expanded to embrace more families and lines of endeavor, parents could encourage and support college education and professional training for sons rather than require them to cement merchandising partnerships and holdings through cousinly marriages. In the decades 1740 to 1759, 66% of marriages in a birth cohort of wealthy merchant families joined first cousins. A hundred years later, the percentage had dropped to 20.6%, still a high proportion that was certainly atypical of Yankee families with lesser wealth. In the Old South, it would be surprising to discover an equally dramatic change during those years in old, eastern, and wealthy neighborhoods. Probably the decline was gradual. In fact, Anne Boucher has found that cousin marriages actually increased in the Falkland District of Alabama, where 10% of a wealthy slaveholding group in 1860 were married cousins and 38% were so connected in the period 1861 to 1880. No doubt the strategy reflected the concentration of wealth in an ever-narrowing circle at the top under the duress of war, slave sequestration, and a static post-war economy. This sort of defensive policy in the face of declining prospects certainly had precedent in antebellum Virginia. Thomas Nelson Page, the famous post-Civil War romantic novelist, served in his example. Lorraine Holland points out that his parents were first cousins, his maternal grandparents were first cousins, and his maternal great-grandparents were first cousins. Six of his fourth-generation ancestors were fathered by the same man, King Carter. Sometimes, though probably most infrequently, a will even stipulated that the disposition of plantation property was to rest upon cousinly unions. William Porcher Dubose's uncle, William DeVoe, for whom he was named, urged him to marry one of his two nieces, declaring, if you marry one of these girls, here is a plantation I'll give you, so look out now. Dubose, later an Episcopal theologian, refused to comply. Other young men were more obliging when presented with temptations subtly or overtly offered. Silk Hope, one of the Manigo holdings in South Carolina, passed from Gabriel Manigo's hands by sale to John Hayward, his sister's husband. Twenty years later, in 1825, Hayward's daughter married her first cousin Charles, Gabriel's son, whereupon Hayward presented his son-in-law and nephew with Silk Hope and 126 slaves as dowry. Thus, the Manigos once more acquired a handsome property and thereafter held it for over 100 years. Besides the marriage of first cousins, another common pattern was the pairing of sisters in one family with the brothers in another, a parallel arrangement called sibling exchange by behavioral scientists that seemed as frequent among the yeomanry as among the very wealthy. It was customary practice for brothers to share implements as well as chores and social life. If they married sisters, they were likely to continue these convenient arrangements. Moreover, marrying into the same family meant avoiding many of the uncertainties about the eligibility of strangers. Also, inheritances of land might well be contiguous so that the family bonds already well established would continue, even to the point that the next generation in turn would intermarry. How unexceptional such patterns were and how different from northern ones remains to be studied. Nevertheless, it would be safe to guess that except for the Brahmins of Boston and a few other wealthy families in the north, Yankees were less likely to intermarry than southerners were, especially in the lower ranks. In addition, men did not hesitate to wed their deceased wife's sisters, although the American Anglican Church had once condemned such unions. 
As a result of these arrangements, there was often a doubling of connections amongst the offspring. If similar patterns persisted into the next generation, the confusions defied even the most dedicated family genealogist. So complicated was the Randolph family that William Cabell Bruce, John Randolph's biographer, likened it to a tangle of fish hooks because it was impossible to pick up one without drawing three or four with it. By 1879, the children of Dr. Robert C. Randolph, he said, had in their veins the united blood of five of the seven sons of William Randolph, founder of the Klan's American branch. Nor was this simply a matter of preserving lofty familial status and alleged blood purity, a motive that compelled the royal families of Europe to seek partners from within a confined circle of relations. At least as important was the fact that it tended to concentrate plantation inheritances and preserve the capital held in the form of slaves. Curiously, these marital patterns received no bold defense. In fact, family members themselves sometimes grumbled about the practice. But high or low, such marriages took place with the same regularity with which they were mildly criticized. When queried about the matter, one mountain woman told an interviewer, I'd rather they wouldn't marry their kin, but I couldn't help it. We told them everything and they quit writing, but the first thing we knowed, they's married. Yet she clearly had been only half-hearted in her opposition. Worries there might have been, but the advantages seemed evident to those whose relatives intermarried. Sighed one Tennessee mother, my three daughters married Ed's three sons. Ain't nothing that brings a family together like that. She and Ed were already related, so that each set of their grandchildren were blessed with being not only brothers and sisters, but also each other's cousins as well, a double bond relation offering special security. The purpose, as Elmora Matthews, an anthropologist, has explained, was to prevent property dispersals that could throw these marginal folk into abject poverty. At the other end of the social spectrum, there was the enhancement of status and influence through close ties. The Virginia families concerned, for instance, took enormous pride in the fact that the venerable Edmund Pendleton, by a series of cousinly unions, was both the uncle and the first cousin once removed of John Taylor of Caroline, the state's rights philosopher. By permitting such intricate marriage patterns, families not only reinforced positions of honor and wealth, but also ensured continuations of custom and demands for conformity. Blood kinship through marriage offered the promise of stability, both financial and psychological. The claim to cousinship provided easier access to a family circle for courting, and it signified a socially commendable desire for familiarity and equality of social rank. Among the poor more than among the rich, marriage of cousins helped to confine family horizons to the known terrain and to exclude the difficult and dangerous. When asked why there was so much coupling of cousins, a poor white Kentuckian explained, I just felt practically everybody not related to us, all those that wasn't related to us and mixed up with us, was against us. When a poor white farmer's niece married Tom, a hunchback, her uncle wondered, he confessed, if I ought to tell her about Tom being so helpless and all. But since she had been knowing him all her life, I thought she could figure out the matter herself. After all, they were first cousins, even if it didn't look right, and she was healthy enough to meet the burden, he concluded. In addition, ambitious yeomen who married above themselves ran the risk of alienation from their kinfolk and neighbors. Cousin marriages were a means of reducing risks of incompatibility and of economic and social discrepancies that could lead to trouble. Joseph Henrich, an anthropologist and scholar of cultural evolution, has written about the psychological peculiarity of what he calls weird societies, weird being Western, educated, industrial, rich, and democratic. He cites society's prevalence of cousin marriage as a key factor in kinship intensity, which affects how we think about ourselves, our relationships, our motivations, and our emotions. By embedding individuals within dense, interdependent, and inherited webs of social connections, intensive kinship norms regulate people's behavior in subtle and powerful ways. These norms motivate individuals to closely monitor themselves and members of their own group to make sure that everyone stays in line. They also endow elders with substantial authority over junior members. Successfully navigating these kinds of social environments favors conformity to peers, deference to traditional authorities, sensitivity to shame, and an orientation toward the collective, e.g. the clan, over oneself. By contrast, 
When relational bonds are fewer and weaker, individuals tend to forge mutually beneficial relationships, often with strangers. To accomplish this, they must distinguish themselves from the crowd by cultivating their own distinct set of attributes, achievements, and dispositions. Success in these individual-centered worlds favors the cultivation of greater independence, less deference to authority, more guilt, and more concern with personal achievement. While both the antebellum North and South were weird compared to most of the world except for Western Europe, the North was getting weirder at a faster rate than the South, creating growing differences between the two sections' cultures and psychology. The relative persistence of cousin marriage and sibling exchange in the Old South had to do with the customs of the populations that had originally settled there in the 17th and 18th centuries. The Virginia Tidewater region was largely settled by Anglicans from the south and west of England who brought their cavalier culture's emphasis on extended families with them and exercised hegemony over those colonies for the first century of their history. The backcountry was largely settled by Celtic stock from the north of Ireland, the Scottish lowlands, and the northern families of England who likewise brought their clannish family structures with them. By contrast, the Quakers of the Delaware Valley and the Puritans of New England had nuclear family structures and were less kinship intensive, notwithstanding intermarriage among the elite Boston Brahmins. We'll explore how differences in relative weirdness played out in the North versus South culture war in future videos. Make sure you subscribe and hit the bell so you don't miss them. And if you have time, please watch another video or two of mine. It really helps the channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode.